Thanks for the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about the work of the police department uh, for the last year. Um, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to lead the police department and to work with all of you to make Sheboygan a great place um, to live. Um, okay, here we go, I think. So to start out with, I'd just like to really tell you where, where we're coming from. And so our vision as a police department for the last 10 years has been to be the safest community of its size in the United States. So it's a big lofty goal. Um, we're not afraid to take on big goals and, and set big goals and work to accomplish them. So that's what it's about. Our mission is to be the model of excellence in policing by working in partnership with the community and others to fight crime, the fear of crime and disorder, to enforce laws, while safeguarding the constitutional rights of all people, to provide quality service to all of our residents and visitors, and to create a work environment in which we recruit, train, and develop an ex exceptional team of employees. Um, so as you can see, it, it really encompassing, encompasses everything. It's understanding that, that really the key to our success is the employees that, that work for us and that we have to give them the tools and support them so that they can, they can be successful. It's also understanding that that it's not just crime, but the fear of crime that really creates issues in, in neighborhoods and in cities, and really um, trying to take care of that disorder so that, that people feel comfortable in, in getting out of their houses and interacting and really creating community in our city. So I'm gonna start right out with um, what crime looks like. So we have part one crimes for the last 10 years up there, um, and really I would point you to, to two things, and, and I don't want you to get too hung up on this, but I think it's, it's somewhat dramatic. If you looked in, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see total part one crimes for 2009, 2006. And if you look at in the lower right-hand corner for 2019, total part one crimes for 2019 is 911. And what that equates to is a 55% decrease over that 10-year period. Um, I can pull out more numbers for you if you're really interested because in in the 1990s the numbers are even higher and so this is one of the things that we face both as as a community and as a nation um, with the way we share information nowadays it, it creates fear and, and doesn't necessarily um, give reality to what's going on in our cities and in our communities and so why we have crime problems the crime problems today are much less than they've been in the past and there's lots of reasons for those and i'm going to try to talk to you about about some of them um, so i think one of the things that would would jump out at you is our assault number so it's 109 for aggravated assaults in in 2019 and so that's higher than it was in in 2009 um, uh, and I think that's important because just looking at the numbers and not putting in in context makes you think that, that things are, are really out of control. But there's lots of reasons that that happens. N number one is laws change. And so things get classified differently as time goes on. And also, one of our goals is to be the model of excellence, which means that we're always looking at what we're doing, what knowledge that there is about policing and victimization and medical issues and everything that surrounds the work that we do and try to figure out how to get better at that. So of those 109 aggravated assaults that we investigated in 2019, 93% of those cases, the victims and the suspects knew each other. 17% um, were family members and the other 76% were acquaintances. So only about 7%, very small, small number of those incidents are, are their strangers. So the danger isn't going out and walking at night and, and getting abducted or assaulted by some stranger walking down the street. The, 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 the real danger in, in our community is in our families and, and in our relationships. Um, of those 109, 50% of them are domestic abuse incidents. And this is probably underreported, but 33% involve either the use or abuse of alcohol and drugs. And so that's an underlying theme, not only in our, in our community, but really our state. Um, so I talked about uh, us figuring out um, things that we don't know and becoming uh, more aware of what's going on. And so one of those 
uh, illustrations that I would provide to you is, is strangulation and domestic violence. So I can tell you that 10 years ago when I came here, we, wouldn't, we would have known very little about strangulation. So strangulation is when somebody puts their, their hands around somebody's throat and squeeze and constrict and, and stop the blood flow and oxygen from getting to the brain. And so that when, when an officer shows up on a scene and they're investigating that, they're not going to see um, evidence of that. Um, so very underreported in the past, but through research, we've come to understand the importance of strangulation because there's a direct correlation with lethality. So we know that in those domestic violence um, situations um, that, that result in homicide, strangulation is one of the key factors um, that would lead us to, to understand that that escalation is going to happen. And so we've worked with um, our countywide group, the DART team, domestic um, abuse response team, um, to develop best practices and train our officers so that they know to ask these questions, um, so that they can identify these. They have a lethality form that they fill out and that we share with our partners so that not only we know that, that this is a high dangerous and, and lethal uh, relationship and that it, there needs to be an intervention, but, but um, our, all of our system partners know, the district attorney's offices, the judges, the advocates, the service providers, they all get that information so we can take whatever opportunities we can to try to intervene in those cases. Um, and so I guess the big point that I'm making here is not only have we improved the services that we're delivering to the community, but also there's going to be an increase in those numbers because we're recognizing things that we didn't recognize in the past, and we're trying to intervene to stop that from happening um, in further situations. Um, of the 109 cases last year, five of them involved a firearm, and only one of those involved a stranger. So um, our gun crime is, is very low in this community. Now I'm just going to um, throw some outputs at you so that you understand really what's happening um, in, in the background with some of the work that we did or do. So a number that's not on there, but our total open record requests that we processed in 2019 was 6,546 open records requests. So it's something that, that's growing and something that, that we spend a lot of time doing. Um, part of that is you'll see um, there's was 197 re open records requests just for digital files. And so as we enter the digital world, that's something that we've taken on and, and something that's going to continue to be a big obstacle for us. Obviously, there's, there's lots of benefits to it. And so we've gotten body cams. And I know that the narrative behind body cams was it was going to catch the police doing all kinds of bad things. But really, really, the the, the, the truth is, is that it helps us collect evidence and provide better cases to the district attorney and city attorney, um, and it helps them resolve those issues faster. Um, discovery requests for, for digital evidence, we had 1,326 just last year, um, and we've provided uh, mostly to the district attorney's office, but 8,975 digital files, uh, mostly body cam video to them. So lots of processing there. We've worked very hard to try to streamline the process so that there's less work involved. Um, but it's going to be something that we're going to have to continue to deal with. In the lower left-hand corner, forensic, down, uh, forensic phone downloads. Last year we did 992. So as everybody is now carrying a computer around with them everywhere they go, that piece of equipment is becoming more and more important in our criminal cases and requiring us um, to do lots more work, not only downloading phones, but really the bigger key then is spending the time going through all of the information um, that we download to figure out what's evidence or what might in, uh, impact a case one way or the other. Um, I think one of the, the, one of the challenges for us um, is to set clearer guidelines, not of what we do process, which phones we do, but rather which ones we don't, because the, the chance to do it is just so great that we're going to have to put limits on it, or we'll never have anybody out on the street doing any work. On the bottom right-hand corner there, 
there's a number 84 child interviews at the Child Advocacy Center. So again, this is us recognizing best practice and how to better deal with victims and provide them a, a better path forward um, for healing and those kinds of things. So the Child Advocacy Center um, is located in Sockville and it's the three counties that, that share it. Sheboygan, Osaki, and Washington County. Sheboygan Police Department is the largest user of the Child Advocacy Center and they provide um, child forensic in interviews and so what what this means is essentially they have experts that are conducting the interviews for us We want to only conduct one interview not multiple interviews to reduce the level of trauma on our victims And then they're gonna um, videotape it so that it can be used in court They also provide medical exams so children that are assaulted They have experts that they work with um, from Children's Hospital that are there that help give medical exams, gather and gather evidence. They have advocacy, so we work with Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor is a partner um, with them and they provide advocates for all of our child cases and our sexual assaults so that there's somebody there supporting the victim and, and helping them get to um, available resources. And then the Child Advocacy Center um, also helps provide mental health services where it's needed. Um, so just a couple other things that I would mention here um, last year um, with with not only the opioid but really the drug issue that we have we collected 1,589 pounds of prescription drugs we responded to 26 non-fatal overdoses we administered Narcan seven times to those victims and we investigated 12 fatal overdoses from either opiates or meth methamphetamine, or often what we call poly drugs, so multiple different drugs that they overdosed on. Uh, we participate um, not only in setting up the drug treatment court, but also as a key team member. We're involved in the Sheboygan County Veterans Treatment Court. Um, we're part of um, Healthy Sheboygan County 2020, and we've in instituted a DEC program, um, which is a, a it, it's a drug recognition for children program. So anytime that we respond to a scene and there's drugs that are recovered in the house, um, essentially where children could have access to them, we work with the Child Advocacy Center to get them tested to make sure that, that if they have exposure to those drugs that we can provide them the services to, um, to go forward from there. And that's a partnership um, with Health and Human Services. So this I'm just throwing up here. So the number 25,379 is the total number of law incidents. So this is incidents that we respond to where we um, have a need really to document significant information there. So this is just a snapshot of the number of calls that we respond to. Um, so it's the actual number of interactions that with people um, that we have is much greater than that, but I think it's a good benchmark. And, and then the numbers that I'm really contrasting it that I want you to see is our use of force numbers, and the key ones would be in red. And so of all the contacts that we had in 2019 with citizens, the only uses of force that we had were eight times we deployed or we used a taser on a, a subject that we were taking them into custody so eight times it's not something that's happening every day um, six times we employed active countermeasures and that would be um, punching kicking using a knee strike something like that to overcome somebody's resistance so six times we did that and then three times we deployed um, OC or ole oleoresin capsicum spray to try to overcome their resistance. And then at the top, there was one use of deadly force, and that happened um, when one of our officers who's on the Marshall's Task Force um, was in Ashland, Wisconsin, with the Marshall's Task Force trying to arrest a, a fugitive that was wanted from the state of Oregon, and he armed himself with a rifle and, and got in his car and tried to drive some of them over. But so I, I think that, again, the narrative that the police are out using force on people all the time um, is, is demonstrated much differently in the information here. The next topic, so any of you that go to a neighborhood meeting, what, what you would hear about is driving and traffic accidents. Um, and I would tell you that, that I agree with you that it's a key concern not only of our community but of your police department. And, and what's important is that when we address this issue that we um, 
how would I tell you this, that we look at the big picture and do it in a way that we can be effective. And so we have to treat each individual complaint with care and with concern, but we still have to approach this from a big picture um, in order to be successful. If we're just trying to chase every incident, we're not going to be successful in keeping the numbers down. And so what I would tell you is that today there's more automobiles on the road in Sheboygan than at any time in the past. Um, people are much more distracted than any time in the past, and people are much more aggressive in a bigger hurry than any time in the past. So the fact that our numbers are as low as they are in comparison to past years, uh, we're not anywhere near where I would want to be, but I think we're, we're demonstrating that, that we are showing care and concern and that we're trying to um, approach it in a reasonable and thoughtful, thoughtful way. And the, the real key here is not how many tickets the police can write, but getting each citizen to show that same care and concern and address it at, at that level. So just some more outputs, um, not to bore you, but to show you some of the, the work that's being done. So we responded to 493 alarms. And, and I just throw that number out because this came up about a year, a year and a half ago. Um, uh, on social media with some people believing that, that we're out of line because we're charging some people after they've had multiple false alarms for that. But of these 493 alarms, I would bet that less than two are an actual crime or a burglary. The rest are all false alarms. So they're all times where we have officers involved on other incidents or involved in other work that we're pulling them away and sending them like an emergency to, to somebody's house or business where there's really nothing going on. Um, abandoned vehicles. Um, we get a lot of abandoned vehicle complaints and there's a lot of people in the city that think that that we don't do anything about them. So we towed 192 vehicles last year. And so we, we do aggressively address it as best as we can. Um, and then the other number that I like to talk about at our committee meetings is on the bottom is our um, what we call Chapter 51 emergency detention. So we did 110 of those last year. And so that's 110 times that we had to intervene and um, restrict somebody's freedom so that they could get mental evaluation and hopefully mental treatment to get them out of the crisis that they were in and, and back um, living in our community. So one of the big challenges that, that we had last year and that we'll continue to have is the people on the top row are the people that, that um, retired last year and left us. And so lots of really good people with lots of, uh, of um, experience and a whole lot of knowledge. And so watching all of that walk out the door um, can be a challenge. But I would tell you it's, it's also an opportunity because you see all of those people under there that come in with um, a lot of can-do attitude and a lot of energy. And so our task is really to channel that and get the most out of it. The other thing that they bring really is um, less resistance to change. So many of the things that we're doing, they're more open to and we can move things forward faster with them. So. Um, you know, I think with, with the number of them that we have new officers on second and third shift, it can be sometimes challenging for citizens to be patient with them and let them work through things. But, but as that goes on and they gain the experience, it's really going to be um, a positive thing for the city. We've been very lucky in the quality of the people that we've been able to hire over the last couple of years. So one of the things that, that we've learned um, is the stress that, that law enforcement can have on somebody's personal life um, and work life. And so we've tried to do many things within the department to try to A, lessen that, but B, also make sure that um, the resources are in place for the, those that are struggling. Um, and so we've developed a chaplain's program, a peer support program. Um, we have EAP in the city, and the program that we did last year is what we called Armor Academy. And it's really about um, bringing in family members and significant others of, of the members in our department and sharing with them all the resources that are available, and then also talking to them about what the stressors are in our occupation so that they recognize what's going on. 
uh, maybe provide a little bit more patience to their significant other or family member and recognize when something's going on. And also to try to reduce that stigma so that we have family members that are helping them to, to reach out and use the support systems that we've put in place so that, that they can be healthy and, and productive while at work. We've also done uh, a lot of resiliency training and we have um, Matt Walsh who has went through a program train a trainer for a national resiliency program through the FBI National Academy. And then the last thing I just want to, or the second last thing I just want to touch on briefly is, is our work in the neighborhoods. Um, so the neighborhoods are the lifeblood of this city and where everything really starts. Um, and, and this is really important for multiple reasons, but, but the main reason is because without our officers having relationships with our citizens were not going to be successful. And I talked about this wellness piece. Um, when the officers are running call to call, going from disorder and crisis to disorder and crisis, they, they start to really, um, what do I tell you this? They, they start to get crazy in that they start to think that everybody is in crisis and that everybody's crazy. And so we have to provide opportunities where our officers can see that that's not true and that people really are normal and good people. Um, and, and so not only building those relationships for the citizens, but really building those relationships for, for our officers so that they can stay healthy and maintain a healthy relationship with our citizens. So there's just a couple things there about what it looks like, but it also looks like 270 outreach activities last year. It looks like shop with a cop, blue Santa, hop with a cop, brought with a cop, coffee with a cop, cops and bobbers, safety town, citizens academy, just to name a couple. And then lastly, none of this happens um, by the police department alone. It happens um, through all of your support. Um, the support of the Fire and Police Commission, the support of our citizens, and the, the support of individual citizens and businesses who help um, provide funding to make many of these outreach activities um, happen. So thank you very much.